Introduction to Elective Affinities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Introduction. At the request of Mr. D. W. Niles, publisher, Boston, I have reread, having read with pleasure and profit, in my early life, The Elective Affinities of Goethe, an English translation of which Mr. Niles proposes to publish for the use of the American public, and he does me the honour to think that my views of the value of the book may contribute somewhat to its success among us at this time. It is very true that ideas of social freedom and of inevitable law governing the action of human affections are rapidly spreading in the world at this day, and that I may have done something to aid their growth. Perhaps my name may not, therefore, be inappropriately associated with this reproduction of the work of the greatest genius of Germany, the first who promulgated the thought that there is a chemistry of the mind, and that elective affinities are as powerful and legitimate in the realm of human sentiment as in the realm of matter. If this fundamental thought of the man who has proved to be the seer or prophet of science in so many other things is also a scientific truth, the fact cannot be appreciated by the world too soon, nor its immense sweep of consequences be too clearly foreseen and provided for. It will affect the whole scope of morals and social order, whether we accept it in our theories or not, and the less hurtfully and the more beneficently, in proportion as we thoroughly study and understand the subject. Themes of freedom on all subjects form the staple public sentiment of the world in this age. A doctrine like that of Goethe's is therefore eminently calculated to make progress even unconsciously in this century. Indeed, I think that if there is any objection whatever, which will be felt to the really chaste and simple tale of this great writer, as it shall be read by the American public of to-day, it will be that it is too mild and unpronounced, rather than on account of its radicalism. It may not be sufficiently spiced or high-seasoned either with adventure or with audacity of speculation to suit the already stimulated palates of our modern and progressive community. Indeed, it strikes me almost ludicrous that the translator has shrunk from appending his name to the work, if he has done so from any idea that its dangerous views might tend to impair his reputation. The tale is, in a word, of the simple construction and genial and moderate character of the Vicar of Wakefield, rather than in the exciting style of Dickens' Christmas carols. But everywhere the interest is skilfully kept up, and the subtle insinuation of a great revolutionary doctrine pervades the whole and to the thoughtful reader makes the chief point of interest. Doctrines, however, which are here merely insinuated and illustrated by allusions to science, are now so openly expounded and advocated that a portion of the community will regard the great German as too conservative, while yet doubtless to the great mass of readers the radical element may startle and in some instances offend. But in any event genius has its prerogatives, and the genius of Goethe is incontestable and uncontested. The American public is entitled to know what this great leader of modern thought, one of the founders of comparative anatomy, has thought on the more recondite subject of the chemistry of mind. The question is not, in the first instance, whether his views were right or wrong, true or false, but simply, what were they? And in none of his works is that question so effectively answered as in elective affinities. Undoubtedly he shocked the age he lived in, both by his writings and by his life, even in Germany, where the puritanical element has always had less sway than it has had among us. But now, if the book runs any risk of a failure to command the public interest, it will be, as I have said, for the opposite reason, that it may be thought not radical and outspoken enough. But even this circumstance adds a new ground of interest, in the fact that it presents vividly the opportunity to compare two or three successive generations in respect to the growth of opinion upon a most important subject and the comparison prepares the mind for the still more radical change which the next few years will inevitably produce. It is well to learn not to be shocked or astounded by any of the events which the impending progress of humanity presents, and especially at this epoch, for all of the signs of the times concur to indicate that we are entering upon the most revolutionary period in human society, not, it is to be hoped, of the old style and blind sort, but revolution in respect to opinions and general institutions. Victoria C. Woodhull, 15 East 38th Street, New York, November 1871. End of introduction. Chapter 1 of Elective Affinities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter 1. Edward, so we shall call a wealthy nobleman in the prime of life, had been spending several hours of a fine April morning in his nursery garden, budding the stems of some young trees with cuttings, which had been recently sent to him. He had finished what he was about, and having laid his tools together in their box, was complacently surveying his work, when the gardener came up and complimented his master on his industry. "'Have you seen my wife anywhere?' inquired Edward, as he moved to go away. "'My lady is alone yonder in the new ground,' said the man. "'The summer-house which she has been making on the rock over against the castle is finished to-day, and really it is beautiful. It cannot fail to please your grace. The view from it is perfect. The village at your feet, a little to your right the church with its tower, which you can just see over, and directly opposite you the castle and the garden. "'Quite true,' replied Edward. I can see the people at work a few steps from where I am standing. And then, to the right of the church again, continued the gardener, is the opening of the valley, and you look along over a range of wood and meadow far into the distance. The steps up the rock, too, are excellently arranged. My gracious lady understands these things. It is a pleasure to work under her. Go to her, said Edward, and desire her to be so good as to wait for me there. Tell her I wish to see this new creation of hers, and enjoy it with her. The gardener went rapidly off, and Edward soon followed. Descending the terrace, and stopping as he passed to look into the hot-houses and the forcing-pits, he came presently to the stream, and thence, over a narrow bridge, to a place where the walk leading to the summer-house branched off in two directions. One path led across the churchyard, immediately up the face of the rock. The other, into which he struck, wound away to the left, with a more gradual ascent through a pretty shrubbery. Where the two paths joined again, a seat had been made where he stopped a few moments to rest, and then, following the now single road, he found himself, after scrambling along among steps and slopes of all sorts and kinds, conducted at last through a narrow, more or less steep outlet to the summer-house. Charlotte was standing at the door to receive her husband. She made him sit down where, without moving, he could command a view of the different landscapes through the door and window, these serving as frames in which they were set like pictures. Spring was coming on. A rich, beautiful life would soon everywhere be bursting, and Edward spoke of it with delight. There is only one thing which I should observe, he added. The summer-house itself is rather small. It is large enough for you and me, at any rate, answered Charlotte. Certainly, said Edward. There is room for a third, too, easily. Of course. And for a fourth also, replied Charlotte. For larger parties, we can contrive other places. Now that we are here by ourselves, with no one to disturb us, and in such a pleasant mood, said Edward, it is a good opportunity for me to tell you that I have for some time had something on my mind, about which I have wished to speak to you, but have never been able to muster up my courage. I have observed that there has been something of the sort, said Charlotte. And even now, Edward went on, if it were not for a letter which the post brought me this morning, and which obliges me to come to some resolution to-day, I should very likely have still kept it to myself. "'What is it, then?' asked Charlotte, turning affectionately toward him. "'It concerns our friend the captain,' answered Edward. "'You know the unfortunate position in which he, like many others, is placed. "'It is through no fault of his own, but you may imagine how painful it must be "'for a person with his knowledge and talents and accomplishments to find himself without employment. "'I—I I will not hesitate any longer with what I am wishing for him. "'I should like to have him here with us for a time.' "'We must think about that,' replied Charlotte. "'It should be considered on more sides than one. "'I am quite ready to tell you what I have in view,' returned Edward. "'Through his last letters there is a prevailing tone of despondency. "'Not that he is really in any want. "'He knows thoroughly well how to limit his expenses, "'and I have taken care for everything absolutely necessary. "'It is no distress to him to accept obligations from me. "'All our lives we have been in the habit of borrowing from "'and lending to each other, "'and we could not tell if we would.' how our debtor and creditor account stands. It is being without occupation which is really fretting him. The many accomplishments which he has cultivated in himself, it is his only pleasure, indeed it is his passion, to be daily and hourly exercising for the benefit of others, and now to sit still with his arms folded, or to go on studying, acquiring, and acquiring, when he can make no use of what he already possesses. My dear creature, it is a painful situation, and alone as he is, he feels it doubly and trebly. 
but i thought said charlotte that he had had offers from many different quarters i myself wrote to numbers of my own friends male and female for him and as i have reason to believe not without effect it is true replied edward but these very offers these various proposals have only caused him fresh embarrassment not one of them is at all suitable to such a person as he is he would have nothing to do he would have to sacrifice himself his time his purpose his whole method of life and to that he cannot bring himself the more i think of it all the more i feel about it and the more anxious i am to see him here with us it is very beautiful and amiable in you answered charlotte to enter with so much sympathy into your friend's position only you must allow me to ask you to think of yourself and of me as well i have done that replied edward for ourselves we can have nothing to expect from his presence with us except pleasure and advantage i will say nothing of the expense in any case if he came to us it would be but small and you know he will be of no inconvenience to us at all he can have his own rooms in the right wing of the castle and everything else can be arranged as simply as possible what shall we not be thus doing for him and how agreeable and how profitable may not his society prove to us i have long been wishing for a plan of the property and the grounds he will see to it and get it made you intend yourself to take the management of the estate as soon as our present steward's term is expired and that you know is a serious thing his various information will be of immense benefit to us i feel only too acutely how much i require a person of this kind the country people have knowledge enough but their way of imparting it is confused and not always honest the students from the towns and universities are sufficiently clever and orderly but they are deficient in personal experience from my friend i can promise myself both knowledge and method and hundreds of other circumstances i can easily conceive arising affecting you as well as me and from which i can foresee innumerable advantages thank you for so patiently listening to me now do you say what you think and say it out freely and fully i will not interrupt you very well replied charlotte i will begin at once with a general observation men think most of the immediate the present and rightly their calling being to do and to work women on the other hand more of how things hang together in life and that rightly too because their destiny the destiny of their families is bound up in this interdependence and it is exactly this which it is their mission to promote so now let us cast a glance at our present and our past life and you will acknowledge that the invitation of the captain does not fall in so entirely with our purposes our plans and our arrangements i will go back to those happy days of our earliest intercourse we loved each other young as we then were with all our hearts we were parted you from me your father from an insatiable desire of wealth choosing to marry you to an elderly and rich lady i from you having to give my hand without any special motive to an excellent man whom i respected if i did not love we became again free you first your poor mother at the same time leaving you in possession of your large fortune i later just at the time when you returned from abroad so we met once more we spoke of the past we could enjoy and love the recollection of it we might have been contented in each other's society to leave things as they were you were urgent for our marriage i at first hesitated we were about the same age but i as a woman had grown older than you as a man at last i could not refuse you what you seemed to think the one thing you cared for all the discomfort which you had ever experienced at court in the army or in travelling you were to recover from at my side you would settle down and enjoy life but only with me for your companion i settled my daughter at a school where she could be more completely educated than would be possible in the retirement of the country and i placed my niece ottilie there with her as well who perhaps would have grown up better at home with me under my own care this was done with your consent merely that we might have our own lives to ourselves merely that we might enjoy undisturbed our so long wished for so long delayed happiness we came here and settled ourselves i undertook the domestic part of the menage you the out-of-doors and the general control my own principle has been to meet your wishes in everything to live only for you at least let us give ourselves a fair trial how far in this way we can be enough for one another since the interdependence of things as you call it is your special element replied edward one should either never listen to any of your trains of reasoning or make up one's mind to allow you to be in the right and indeed you have been in the right up to the present day the foundation which we have hitherto been laying for ourselves is of the true sound sort only are we to build nothing upon it 
is nothing to be developed out of it all the work we have done i in the garden you in the park is it all only for a pair of hermits well well replied charlotte very well what we have to look to is that we introduce no alien element nothing which shall cross or obstruct us remember our plans even those which only concern our amusements depend mainly on our being together you were to read to me in consecutive order the journal which you made when you were abroad you were to take the opportunity of arranging it putting all the loose matter connected with it in its place and with me to work with you and help you out of these invaluable but chaotic leaves and sheets to put together a complete thing which should give the pleasure to ourselves and to others i promised to assist you in transcribing and we thought it would be so pleasant so delightful so charming to travel over in recollection the world which we were unable to see together the beginning is already made then in the evenings you have taken up your flute again accompanying me on the piano while of visits backward and forward among the neighbourhood there is abundance for my part i have been promising myself out of all this the first really happy summer i have ever thought to spend in my life only i cannot see replied edward rubbing his forehead how through every bit of this which you have been so sweetly and so sensibly laying before me the captain's presence can be any interruption i should rather have thought it would give it all fresh zest and life he was my companion during a part of my travels he made many observations from a different point of view from mine we can put it all together and so make a charmingly complete work of it well then i will acknowledge openly answered charlotte with some impatience my feeling is against this plan i have an instinct which tells me no good will come of it you women are invincible in this way replied edward you are so sensible that there is no answering you then so affectionate that one is glad to give way to you full of feelings which one cannot wound and full of forebodings which terrify one i am not superstitious said charlotte and i care nothing for these dim sensations merely as such but in general they are the result of unconscious recollections of happy or unhappy consequences which we have experienced as following on our own or others actions nothing is of greater moment in any state of things than the intervention of a third person i have seen friends brothers and sisters lovers husbands and wives whose relation to each other through the accidental or intentional introduction of a third person has been altogether changed whose whole moral condition has been inverted by it that may very well be replied edward with people who live on without looking where they are going but not surely with persons whom experience has taught to understand themselves that understanding ourselves my dearest husband insisted charlotte is no such certain weapon it is very often a most dangerous one for the person who bears it and out of all this at least so much seems to arise that we should not be in too great a hurry let me have a few days to think don't decide as the matter stands returned edward wait as many days as we will we shall still be in too great a hurry the arguments for and against are all before us all we want is the conclusion and as things are i think the best thing we can do is to draw lots i know said charlotte that in doubtful cases it is your way to leave them to chance to me in such a serious matter this seems almost a crime then what am i to write to the captain cried edward for write i must at once write him a kind sensible sympathizing letter answered charlotte that is as good as none at all replied edward and there are many cases answered she in which we are obliged and in which it is the real kindness rather to write nothing than not to write End of chapter one chapter two of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe chapter two edward was alone in his room the repetition of the incidents of his life from charlotte's lips the representation of their mutual situation their mutual purposes had worked him sensitive as he was into a very pleasant state of mind while close to her while in her presence he had felt so happy that he had thought out a warm kind but quiet and indefinite epistle which he would send to the captain when however he had settled himself at his writing-table and taken up his friend's letter to read it over once more the sad condition of this excellent man rose again vividly before him the feelings which had been all day distressing him again awoke and it appeared impossible to him to leave one whom he called his friend in such painful embarrassment edward was unaccustomed to deny himself anything 
the only child and consequently the spoiled child of wealthy parents who had persuaded him into a singular but highly advantageous marriage with a lady far older than himself and again by her petted and indulged in every possible way she seeking to reward his kindness to her by the utmost liberality after her early death his own master travelling independently of every one equal to all contingencies and all changes with desires never excessive but multiple and various free-hearted generous brave at times even noble what was there in the world to cross or thwart him hitherto everything had gone as he desired charlotte had become his he had won her at last with an obstinate a romantic fidelity and now he felt himself for the first time contradicted crossed in his wishes when those wishes were to invite to his home the friend of his youth just as he was longing as it were to throw open his whole heart to him he felt annoyed impatient he took up his pen again and again and as often threw it down again because he could not make up his mind what to write against his wife's wishes he would not go against her expressed desire he could not ill at ease as he was it would have been impossible for him even if he had wished to write a quiet easy letter the most natural thing to do was to put it off in a few words he begged his friend to forgive him for having left his letter unanswered that day he was unable to write circumstantially but shortly he hoped to be able to tell him what he felt at greater length the next day as they were walking to the same spot charlotte took the opportunity of bringing back the conversation to the subject perhaps because she knew that there is no surer way of rooting out any plan or purpose than by often talking it over it was what edward was wishing he expressed himself in his own way kindly and sweetly for although sensitive as he was he flamed up readily although the vehemence with which he desired anything made him pressing and his obstinacy made him impatient his words were so softened by his wish to spare the feelings of those to whom he was speaking that it was impossible not to be charmed even when one most disagreed with him this morning he first contrived to bring charlotte into the happiest humour and then so disarmed her with the graceful turn which she gave to the conversation that she cried out at last you are determined that what i refuse to the husband you will make me grant to the lover at least my dearest she continued i will acknowledge that your wishes and the warmth and sweetness with which you express them have not left me untouched have not left me unmoved you drive me to make a confession till now i too have had a concealment from you i am in exactly the same position with you and i have hitherto been putting the same restraint on my inclination which i have been exhorting you to put on yours glad am i to hear that said edward in the married state a difference of opinion now and then i see is no bad thing we learn something of one another by it you are to learn at present then said charlotte that it is with me about ottilie as it is with you about the captain the dear child is most uncomfortable at the school and i am thoroughly uneasy about her luciana my daughter born as she is for the world is there training hourly for the world languages history everything that is taught there she acquires with so much ease that as it were she learns them off at sight she has quick natural gifts and an excellent memory one may almost say she forgets everything and in a moment calls it all back again she distinguishes herself above every one at the school with the freedom of her carriage the grace of her movement and the elegance of her address and with the inborn royalty of nature makes herself the queen of the little circle there the superior of the establishment regards her as a little divinity who under her hands is shaping into excellence and who will do her honour gain her reputation and bring her a large increase of pupils the first pages of this good lady's letters and her monthly notices of progress are for ever hymns about the excellence of such a child which i have to translate into my own prose while her concluding sentences about ottilie are nothing but excuse after excuse attempts at explaining how it can be that a girl in other respects growing up so lovely seems coming to nothing and shows neither capacity nor accomplishment this and the little she has to say besides is no riddle to me because i can see in this dear child the same character as that of her mother who was my own dearest friend who grew up with myself and whose daughter i am certain if i had the care of her education would form into an exquisite creature this however has not fallen in with our plan and as one ought not to be picking and pulling or for ever introducing new elements among the conditions of our life i think it better to bear and to conquer as i can even the unpleasant impression that my daughter who knows very well that poor ottilie is entirely dependent upon us does not refrain from flourishing her own successes in her face and so to a certain extent destroys the little good which we have done for her who are well trained enough never to wound others by a parade of their own advantages 
and who stands so high as not at times to suffer under such a slight in trials like these ottilie's character is growing in strength but since i have clearly known the painfulness of her situation i have been thinking over all possible ways to make some other arrangement every hour i am expecting an answer to my own last letter and then i do not mean to hesitate any more so my dear edward it is with me we have both you see the same sorrows to bear touching both our hearts in the same point let us bear them together since we neither of us can press our own against the other we are strange creatures said edward smiling if we can only put out of sight anything which troubles us we fancy at once we have got rid of it we can give up much in the large and general but to make sacrifices in little things is a demand to which we are rarely equal so it was with my mother as long as i lived with her while a boy and a young man she could not bear to let me be a moment out of her sight if i was out later than usual in my ride some misfortune must have happened to me if i got wet through in a shower a fever was inevitable i travelled i was absent from her altogether and at once i scarcely seemed to belong to her if we look at it closer he continued we are both acting very foolishly very culpably two very noble natures both of which have the closest claims on our affection we are leaving exposed to pain and distress merely to avoid exposing ourselves to a chance of danger if this is not to be called selfish what is you take ottilie let me have the captain and for a short period at least let the trial be made we might venture it said charlotte thoughtfully if the danger were only to ourselves but do you think it prudent to bring ottilie and the captain into a situation where they must necessarily be so closely intimate the captain a man no older than yourself of an age i am not saying this to flatter you when a man becomes first capable of love and first deserving of it and a girl of ottilie's attractiveness i cannot conceive how you can rate ottilie so high replied edward i can only explain it to myself by supposing her to have inherited your affection for her mother pretty she is no doubt i remember the captain observing it to me when we came back last year and met her at your aunt's attractive she is she has particularly pretty eyes but i do not know that she made the slightest impression upon me that was quite proper in you said charlotte seeing that i was there and although she is much younger than i the presence of your old friend had so many charms for you that you overlooked the promise of the opening beauty it is one of your ways and that is one reason why it is so pleasant to live with you charlotte openly as she appeared to be speaking was keeping back something nevertheless which was that at the time when edward came first back from abroad she had purposely thrown ottilie in his way to secure if possible so desirable a match for her protege for of herself at that time in connection with edward she never thought at all the captain also had a hint given to him to draw edward's attention to her but the latter who was clinging determinately to his early affection for charlotte looked neither right nor left and was only happy in the feeling that it was at last within his power to obtain for himself the one happiness which he so earnestly desired and which a series of incidents had appeared to have placed for ever beyond his reach they were on the point of descending the new grounds in order to return to the castle when a servant came hastily to meet them and with a laugh on his face called up from below will your grace be pleased to come quickly to the castle the herr mittler has just galloped into the court he shouted to us to go all of us in search of you and we were to ask whether there was need whether there's need he cried after us do you hear but be quick be quick the odd fellow exclaimed edward but has he not come at the right time charlotte tell him there is need grievous need he must alight see his horse taken care of take him into the saloon and let him have some luncheon we shall be with him immediately let us take the nearest way he said to his wife and struck into the path across the churchyard which he usually avoided he was not a little surprised to find here too traces of charlotte's delicate hand sparing as far as possible the old monuments she had contrived to level it and lay it carefully out so as to make it appear a pleasant spot on which the eye and the imagination could equally repose with pleasure the older stones had each their special honour assigned them they were ranged according to their dates along the wall either leaning against it or let into it or however it could be contrived and the string course of the church was thus variously ornamented edward was singularly affected as he came in upon it through the little wicket he pressed charlotte's hand and tears started into his eyes but these were very soon put to flight by the appearance of their singular visitor this gentleman had declined sitting down in the castle he had ridden straight through the village to the churchyard gate and then halting he called out to his friends are you not making a fool of me is there need really if there is i can stay till midday but don't keep me i have a great deal to do before night since you have taken the trouble to come so far cried edward to him in answer 
you had better come through the gate we meet at a solemn spot come and see the variety which charlotte has thrown over its sadness inside there called out the rider come i neither on horseback nor in carriage nor on foot these here rest in peace with them i have nothing to do one day i shall be carried in feet foremost i must bear that as i can is it serious i want to know indeed it is cried charlotte right serious for the first time in our married lives we are in a strait and difficulty from which we do not know how to extricate ourselves you do not look as if it were so answered he but i will believe you if you are deceiving me for the future you shall help yourselves follow me quickly my horse will be none the worse for a rest the three speedily found themselves in the saloon together luncheon was brought in and mittler told them what that day he had done and was going to do this eccentric person had in early life been a clergyman and had distinguished himself in his office by the never-resting activity with which he contrived to make up and put an end to quarrels quarrels in families and quarrels between neighbours first among the individuals immediately about him and afterward among whole congregations and among the country gentlemen round while he was in the ministry no married couple were allowed to separate and the district courts were untroubled with either cause or process a knowledge of the law he was well aware was necessary to him he gave himself with all his might to the study of it and very soon felt himself a match for the best trained advocate his circle of activity extended wonderfully and people were on the point of inducing him to move to the residence where he would find opportunities of exercising in the higher circles what he had begun in the lowest when he won a considerable sum of money in a lottery with this he bought himself a small property he let the ground to a tenant and made it the centre of his operations with the fixed determination or rather in accordance with his old customs and inclinations never to enter a house when there was no dispute to make up and no help to be given people who were superstitious about names and about what they imported maintained that it was his being called mittler which drove him to take upon himself this strange employment luncheon was laid on the table and the stranger then solemnly pressed his host not to wait any longer with the disclosure which he had to make immediately after refreshing himself he would be obliged to leave them husband and wife made a circumstantial confession but scarcely had he caught the substance of the matter when he started angrily up from the table rushed out of the saloon and ordered his horse to be saddled instantly either you do not know me you do not understand me he cried or you are sorely mischievous do you call this a quarrel is there any want of help here do you suppose that i am in the world to give advice of all occupations which man can pursue that is the most foolish every man must be his own counsellor and do what he cannot let alone if all go well let him be happy let him enjoy his wisdom and his fortune if it go ill i am at hand to do what i can for him the man who desires to be rid of an evil knows what he wants but the man who desires something better than he has got is stone blind yes yes laugh as you will he is plain blind man's buff perhaps he gets hold of something but the question is what has he got hold of do as you will it is all one invite your friends to you or let them be it is all the same the most prudent plans i have seen miscarry and the most foolish succeed don't split your brains about it and if one way or the other evil comes of what you settle don't fret send for me and you shall be helped till which time i am your humble servant so saying he sprang on his horse without waiting the arrival of the coffee here you see said charlotte the small service a third person can be when things are off their balance between two persons closely connected we are left if possible more confused and more uncertain than we were they would both probably have continued hesitating some time longer had not a letter arrived from the captain in reply to edward's last he had made up his mind to accept one of the situations which had been offered him although it was not in the least up to his mark he was to share the ennui of certain wealthy persons of rank who depended on his ability to dissipate it edward's keen glance saw into the whole thing and he pictured it out in just sharp lines can we endure to think of our friend in such a position he cried you cannot be so cruel charlotte that strange mittler is right after all replied charlotte all such undertakings are ventures what will come of them it is impossible to foresee new elements introduced among us may be fruitful in fortune or in misfortune without our having to take credit to ourselves for one or the other i do not feel myself firm enough to oppose you further let us make the experiment only one thing i will entreat of you that it be only for a short time you must allow me to exert myself more than ever to use all my influence among all my connections to find him some position which will satisfy him in his own way edward poured out the warmest expressions of gratitude he hastened with a light happy heart to write off his proposals to his friend 
charlotte in a postscript was to signify her approbation with her own hand and unite her own kind entreaties with his she wrote with a rapid pen pleasantly and affectionately but yet with a sort of haste which was not usual with her and most unlike herself she disfigured the paper at last with a blot of ink which put her out of temper and which she only made worse with her attempts to wipe it away edward laughed at her about it and as there's still room added a second postscript that his friend was to see from this symptom the impatience with which he was expected and measure the speed at which he came to them by the haste in which the letter was written the messenger was gone and edward thought he could not give a more convincing evidence of his gratitude than by insisting again and again that charlotte should at once send for ottilie from the school she said she would think about it and for that evening induced edward to join with her in the enjoyment of a little music charlotte played exceedingly well on the piano edward not quite so well on the flute he had taken a great deal of pains with it at times but he was without the patience without the perseverance which are requisite for the completely successful cultivation of such a talent consequently his part was done unequally some pieces well only perhaps too quickly while with others he hesitated not being quite familiar with them so that for any one else it would have been difficult to have gone through a duet with him but charlotte knew how to manage it she held in or let herself be run away with and fulfilled in this way the double part of a skilful conductor and a prudent housewife who are able always to keep right on the whole although particular passages will now and then fall out of order End of chapter two chapter three of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe chapter three the captain came having previously written a most sensible letter which had entirely quieted charlotte's apprehensions so much clearness about himself so just an understanding of his own position and the position of his friends promised everything which was best and happiest the conversation of the first few hours as is generally the case with friends who have not met for a long time was eager lively almost exhausting toward evening charlotte proposed a walk to the new grounds the captain was delighted with the spot and observed every beauty which had been first brought into sight and made enjoyable by the new walks he had a practised eye and at the same time one easily satisfied and although he knew very well what was really valuable he never as so many persons do made people who were showing him things of their own uncomfortable by requiring more than the circumstances admitted of or by mentioning anything more perfect which he remembered having seen elsewhere when they arrived at the summer-house they found it dressed out for a holiday only indeed with artificial flowers and evergreens but with some pretty bunches of natural corn ears among them and other field and garden fruit so as to do credit to the taste which had arranged them although my husband does not like in general to have his birthday or christening day kept charlotte said he will not object to-day to these few ornaments being expended on a treble festival treble cried edward yes indeed she replied our friend's arrival here we are bound to keep as a festival and have you never thought either of you that this is the day on which you were both christened are you not both named otto the two friends shook hands across the little table you bring back to my mind edward said this little link of our boyish affection as children we were both called so but when we came to be at school together it was the cause of much confusion and i readily made over to him all my right to the pretty laconic name wherein you were not altogether so very high-minded said the captain for i well remember that the name of edward had then begun to please you better from its attractive sound when spoken by certain pretty lips they were now sitting all three round the same table where charlotte had spoken so vehemently against their guests coming to them edward happy as he was did not wish to remind his wife of that time but he could not help saying there is good room here for one more person at this moment the notes of a bugle were heard across from the castle full of happy thoughts and feelings as her friends all were together the sound fell in among them with a strong force of answering harmony they listened silently each for the moment withdrawing into himself and feeling doubly happy in the fair circle of which he formed a part the pause was first broken by edward who started up and walked out in front of the summer-house our friend must not think he said to charlotte that this narrow little valley forms the whole of our domain and possessions let us take him up to the top of the hill where he can see further and breathe more freely for this once then answered charlotte we must climb up the old footpath which is not too easy by the next time i hope my walks and steps will have been carried right up and so among rocks and shrubs and bushes they made their way to the summit where they found themselves not on a level flat but on a sloping grassy terrace running along the ridge of the hill 
the village with the castle behind it was out of sight at the bottom of the valley sheets of water were seen spreading out right and left with wooded hills rising immediately from their opposite margin and at the end of the upper water a wall of sharp precipitous rocks directly overhanging it their huge forms reflected in its level surface in the hollow of the ravine where a considerable brook ran into the lake lay a mill half hidden among the trees a sweetly retired spot most beautifully surrounded and through the entire semicircle over which the view extended ran an endless variety of hills and valleys copse and forest the early green of which promised the near approach of a luxuriant clothing of foliage in many places particular groups of trees caught the eye and especially a cluster of plains and poplars directly at the spectator's feet close to the edge of the centre lake they were at their full growth and they stood there spreading out their boughs all around them in fresh and luxuriant strength to these edward called his friend's attention i myself planted them he cried when i was a boy they were small trees which i rescued when my father was laying out the new part of the great castle garden and in the middle of one summer had rooted them out this year you will no doubt see them show their gratitude in a fresh set of shoots they returned to the castle in high spirits and mutually pleased with each other to the guest was allotted an agreeable and roomy set of apartments in the right wing of the castle and here he rapidly got his books and papers and instruments in order to go on with his usual occupation but edward for the first few days gave him no rest he took him about everywhere now on foot now on horseback making him acquainted with the country and with the estate and he embraced the opportunity of imparting to him the wishes which he had been long entertaining of getting at some better acquaintance with it and learning to manage it more profitably the first thing we have to do said the captain is to make a magnetic survey of the property that is a pleasant and easy matter and if it does not admit of entire exactness it will be always useful and will do at any rate for an agreeable beginning it can be made too without any great staff of assistance and one can be sure of getting it completed if by and by you come to require anything more exact it would be easy then to find some plan to have it made the captain was exceedingly skilful at work of this kind he had brought with him whatever instruments he required and commenced immediately edward provided him with a number of foresters and peasants who with his instruction were able to render him all necessary assistance the weather was favourable the evenings and the early mornings were devoted to the designing and drawing and in a short time it was all filled in and coloured edward saw his possessions grow out like a new creation upon the paper and it seemed as if now for the first time he knew what they were as if they now first were properly his own thus there came occasion to speak of the park and of the ways of laying it out a far better disposition of things being made possible after a survey of this kind than could be arrived at by experimenting on nature on partial and accidental impressions we must make my wife understand this said edward we must do nothing of the kind replied the captain who did not like bringing his own notions in collision with those of others he had learned by experience that the motives and purposes by which men are influenced are far too various to be made to coalesce upon a single point even on the most solid representations we must not do it he cried she will be only confused with her as with all people who employ themselves on such matters merely as amateurs the important thing is rather that she shall do something than that something shall be done such persons feel their way with nature they have fancies for this plan or that they do not venture on removing obstacles they are not bold enough to make a sacrifice they do not know beforehand in what their work is to result they try an experiment it succeeds it fails they alter it they alter perhaps what they ought to leave alone and leave what they ought to alter and so at last there always remains but a patchwork which pleases and amuses but never satisfies acknowledge candidly said edward that you do not like this new work of hers the idea is excellent he replied if the execution were equal to it there would be no fault to find but she has tormented herself to find her way up that rock and she now torments every one if you must have it that she takes up after her you cannot walk together you cannot walk behind one another with any freedom every moment your step is interrupted one way or another there is no end to the mistakes which she has made would it have been easy to have done it otherwise asked edward perfectly replied the captain she had only to break away a corner of the rock which is now but an unsightly object made up as it is of little pieces and she would at once have a sweep for her walk and stone in abundance for the rough masonry work to widen it in the bad places and make it smooth but this i tell you in strictest confidence her it would only confuse and annoy what is done must remain as it is if any more money and labour is to be spent there there is abundance to do above the summer-house on the hill which we can settle our own way if the two friends found in their occupation abundance of present employment 
There was no lack either of entertaining reminiscences of early times, in which Charlotte took her part as well. They determined, moreover, that as soon as their immediate labours were finished, they would go to work upon the journal, and in this way too reproduce the past. For the rest, when Edward and Charlotte were alone, there were fewer matters of private interest between them than formerly. This was especially the case since the fault-finding about the grounds, which Edward thought so just, and which he felt to the quick. He held his tongue about what the captain had said for a long time, but at last when he saw his wife again preparing to go to work above the summer-house with her paths and steps, he could not contain himself any longer, but after a few circumlocutions came out with his new views. Charlotte was thoroughly disturbed. She was sensible enough to perceive at once that they were right, but there was a difficulty with what was already done, and what was made was made. She had liked it. Even what was wrong had become dear to her in its details. She fought against her convictions. She defended her little creations. She railed at men who were for ever going to the broad and the great. They could not let a pastime, they could not let an amusement alone, she said, but they must go and make a work out of it, never thinking of the expense which their larger plans involved. She was provoked, annoyed, and angry. Her old plans she could not give up. The new she would not quite throw from her, but, divided as she was, for the present she put a stop to the work, and gave herself time to think the thing over, and let it ripen by itself. At the same time that she lost this source of active amusement, the others were more and more together over their own business. They took to occupying themselves, moreover, with the flower-garden and the hot-houses, and as they filled up the intervals with the ordinary gentlemen's amusements, hunting, riding, buying, selling, breaking horses, and such matters, she was every day left more and more to herself. She devoted herself more assiduously than ever to her correspondence on account of the captain, and yet she had many lonely hours, so that the information which she now received from the school became of more agreeable interest. To a long-drawn letter of the superior of the establishment, filled with the usual expressions of delight at her daughter's progress, a brief postscript was attached, with a second from the hand of a gentleman in employment there as an assistant, both of which we here communicate. Postscript of the Superior Of Ottilie I can only repeat to your ladyship what I have already stated in my former letters. I do not know how to find fault with her, yet I cannot say that I am satisfied. She is always unassuming, always ready to oblige others, but it is not pleasing to see her so timid, so almost servile. Your ladyship lately sent her some money with several little matters for her wardrobe, the money she has never touched, the dresses lay unworn in their place. She keeps her things very nice and very clean, but this is all she seems to care about. Again, I cannot praise her excessive abstemiousness in eating and drinking. There is no extravagance at our table, but there is nothing that I like better than to see the children eat enough of good, wholesome food. What is carefully provided and set before them ought to be taken, and to this I never can succeed in bringing Ottilie. She is always making herself some occupation or other, always finding something which she must do, something which the servants have neglected, to escape the second course or the dessert. And now it has to be considered, which I cannot help connecting with all this, that she frequently suffers, I have lately learned, from pain in the left side of her head. It is only at times, but it is distressing and may be of importance. So much upon this otherwise sweet and lovely girl. Second postscript by the assistant. Our excellent superior commonly permits me to read the letters in which she communicates her observations upon her pupils to their parents and friends. Such of them as are addressed to your ladyship I ever read with twofold attention and pleasure. We have to congratulate you upon a daughter who unites in herself every brilliant quality with which people distinguish themselves in the world, and I at least think you no less fortunate in having had bestowed upon you, in your stepdaughter, a child who has been born for the good and happiness of others, and assuredly also for her own. Ottilie is almost our only pupil about whom there is a difference of opinion between myself and our reverend superior. I do not complain of the very natural desire in that good lady to see outward and definite fruits arising from her labours. But there are also fruits which are not outward, which are of the true germinal sort, and which develop themselves sooner or later in a beautiful life. And this, I am certain, is the case with your protégé. So long as she has been under my care, I have watched her moving with an even step, slowly, steadily forward, never back. As with a child, it is necessary to begin everything at the beginning, so it is with her. She can comprehend nothing which does not follow from what precedes it. Let a thing be as simple and easy as possible, she can make nothing of it, if it is not in a recognisable connection. But find the intermediate links, and make them clear to her, and then nothing is too difficult for her. Progressing with such slow steps, she remains behind her companions who, with capacities of quite a different kind, hurry on and on, 
learn everything readily connected or unconnected recollect it with ease and apply it with correctness and again some of the lessons here are given by excellent but somewhat hasty and impatient teachers who pass from result to result cutting short the process by which they are arrived at and these are not of the slightest service to her she learns nothing from them there is a complaint of her handwriting they say she will not or cannot understand how to form her letters i have examined closely into this it is true she writes slowly stiffly if you like but the hand is neither timid nor without character the french language is not my department but i have taught her something of it in the step-by-step -step fashion and this she understands easily indeed it is singular that she knows a great deal and knows it well too and yet when she is asked a question it seems as if she knew nothing to conclude generally i should say she learns nothing like a person who is being educated but she learns like one who is to educate not like a pupil but like a future teacher your ladyship may think it strange that i as an educator and a teacher can find no higher praise to give to any one than by a comparison with myself i may leave it to your own good sense to your deep knowledge of the world and of mankind to make the best of my most inadequate but well-intended expressions you may satisfy yourself that you have much happiness to promise yourself from this child i commend myself to your ladyship and i beseech you to permit me to write to you again as soon as i see reason to believe that i have anything important or agreeable to communicate this letter gave charlotte great pleasure the contents of it coincided very closely with the notions which she had herself conceived of ottilie at the same time she could not help smiling at the excessive interest of the assistant which seemed greater than the insight into a pupil's excellence usually calls forth in her quiet unprejudiced way of looking at things this relation among others she was contented to permit to lie before her as a possibility she could value the interest of so sensible a man in ottilie having learned among the lessons of her life to see how highly true regard is to be prized in a world where indifference or dislike are the common natural residents End of chapter 3chapter four of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe chapter four the topographical chart of the property and its environs was completed it was executed on a considerable scale the character of the particular localities was made intelligible by various colours and by means of a trigonometrical survey the captain had been able to arrive at a very fair exactness of measurement he had been rapid in his work there was scarcely ever any one who could do with less sleep than this most laborious man and as his day was always devoted to an immediate purpose every evening something had been done let us now he said to his friend go on to what remains for us to the statistics of the estate we shall have a good deal of work to get through at the beginning and afterward we shall come to the farm estimates and much else which will naturally arise out of them only we must have one thing distinctly settled and adhered to everything which is properly business we must keep carefully separate from life business requires earnestness and method life must have a freer handling business demands the utmost stringency and sequence in life inconsecutiveness is frequently necessary indeed is charming and graceful if you are firm in the first you can afford yourself more liberty in the second while if you mix them you will find the free interfering with and breaking in upon the fixed in these sentiments edward felt a slight reflection upon himself though not naturally disorderly he could never bring himself to arrange his papers in their proper places what he had to do in connection with others was not kept separate from what only depended on himself business got mixed up with amusement and serious work with recreation now however it was easy for him with the help of a friend who would take the trouble upon himself and a second eye worked out the separation to which the single eye was always unequal in the captain's wing they contrived a depository for what concerned the present and an archive for the past here they brought all the documents papers and notes from their various hiding-places rooms drawers and boxes with the utmost speed harmony and order were introduced into the wilderness and the different packets were marked and registered in their several pigeon-holes they found all they wanted in greater completeness even than they had expected and here an old clerk was found of no slight service who for the whole day and part of the night never left his desk and with whom till then edward had been always dissatisfied i should not know him again he said to his friend the man is so handy and useful that replied the captain is because we give him nothing fresh to do till he has finished at his convenience what he has already and so as you perceive he gets through a great deal 
if you disturb him he becomes useless at once spending their days together in this way in the evenings they never neglected their regular visits to charlotte if there was no party from the neighbourhood as was often the case they read and talked principally on subjects connected with the improvement of the condition of social life charlotte always accustomed to make the most of opportunities not only saw her husband pleased but found personal advantages for herself various domestic arrangements which she had long wished to make but which she did not know exactly how to set about were managed for her through the contrivance of the captain her domestic medicine chest hitherto but poorly furnished was enlarged and enriched and charlotte herself with the help of good books and personal instruction was put in the way of being able to exercise her disposition to be of practical assistance more frequently and more efficiently than before in providing against accidents which though common yet only too often find us unprepared they thought it especially necessary to have at hand whatever is required for the recovery of drowning men accidents of this kind from the number of canals reservoirs and waterworks in the neighbourhood being of frequent occurrence this department the captain took expressly into his own hands and the observation escaped edward that a case of this kind had made a very singular epoch in the life of his friend the latter made no reply but seemed to be trying to escape from a painful recollection edward immediately stopped and charlotte who as well as he had a general knowledge of the story took no notice of the expression these preparations are all exceedingly valuable said the captain one evening now however we have not got the one thing which is most essential a sensible man who understands how to manage it all i know an army surgeon whom i could exactly recommend for the place you might get him at this moment on easy terms he is highly distinguished in his profession and has frequently done more for me in the treatment even of violent inward disorders than celebrated physicians help upon the spot is the thing you often most want in the country he was written for at once and edward and charlotte were rejoiced to have found so good and necessary an object on which to expend so much of the money which they set apart for such accidental demands upon them thus charlotte too found means of making use for her purposes of the captain's knowledge and practical skill and she began to be quite reconciled to his presence and to feel easy about any consequences which might ensue she commonly prepared questions to ask him among other things it was one of her anxieties to provide against whatever was prejudicial to health and comfort against poisons and such like the lead glazing on the china the verdigris which formed about her copper and bronze vessels etc had long been a trouble to her she got him to tell her about these and naturally they often had to fall back on the first elements of medicine and chemistry an accidental but welcome occasion for entertainment of this kind was given by an inclination of edward to read aloud he had a particularly clear deep voice and earlier in life had earned himself a pleasant reputation for his feeling and lively recitations of works of poetry and oratory at this time he was occupied with other subjects and the books which for some time past he had been reading were either chemical or on some other branch of natural or technical science one of his especial peculiarities which by the by he very likely shares with a number of his fellow-creatures was that he could not bear to have any one looking over him when he was reading in early life when he used to read poems plays or stories this had been the natural consequence of the desire which the reader feels like the poet or the actor or the story-teller to make surprises to pause to excite expectation and this sort of effect was naturally defeated when a third person's eyes could run on before him and see what was coming on such occasions therefore he was accustomed to place himself in such a position that no one could get behind him with a party of only three this was unnecessary and as with the present subject there was no opportunity for exciting feelings or giving the imagination a surprise he did not take any particular pains to protect himself one evening he had placed himself carelessly and charlotte happened by accident to cast her eyes upon the page his old impatience was aroused he turned to her and said almost unkindly i do wish once for all you would leave off doing a thing so out of taste and so disagreeable when i read aloud to a person is it not the same as if i was telling him something by word of mouth the written the printed word is in the place of my own thoughts of my own heart if a window were broken into my brain or into my heart and if the man to whom i am counting out my thoughts or delivering my sentiments one by one knew already beforehand exactly what was to come out of me should i take the trouble to put them into words when anybody looks over my book i always feel as if i were being torn in two charlotte's tact in whatever circle she might be large or small was remarkable and she was able to set aside disagreeable or excited expressions without appearing to notice them when a conversation grew tedious she knew how to interrupt it when it halted she could set it going and this time her good gift did not forsake her 
i am sure you will forgive me my fault she said when i tell you what it was this moment which came over me i heard you reading something about affinities and i thought directly of some relations of mine two of whom are just now occupying me a great deal then my attention went back to the book i found it was not about living things at all and i looked over to get the thread of it right again it was the comparison which led you wrong and confused you said edward the subject is nothing but earths and minerals but man is a true narcissus he delights to see his own image everywhere and he spreads himself underneath the universe like the amalgam behind the glass quite true continued the captain that is the way in which he treats everything external to himself his wisdom and his folly his will and his caprice he attributes alike to the animal the plant the elements and the gods would you said charlotte if it is not taking you away too much from the immediate subject tell me briefly what is meant here by affinities i shall be very glad indeed replied the captain to whom charlotte had addressed herself that is i will tell you as well as i can my ideas on the subject date ten years back whether the scientific world continues to think the same about it i cannot tell it is most disagreeable cried edward that one cannot nowadays learn a thing once for all and have done with it our forefathers could keep to what they were taught when they were young but we have every five years to make revolutions with them if we do not wish to drop altogether out of fashion we women need not be so particular said charlotte and to speak the truth i only want to know the meaning of the word there is nothing more ridiculous in society than to misuse a strange technical word and i only wish you to tell me in what sense the expression is made use of in connection with these things what its scientific application is i am quite contented to leave to the learned who by the by as far as i have been able to observe do not find it easy to agree among themselves whereabout shall we begin said edward after a pause to the captain to come most quickly to the point the latter after thinking a little while replied shortly you must let me make what will seem a wide sweep we shall be on our subject almost immediately charlotte settled her work at her side promising the fullest attention the captain began in all natural objects with which we are acquainted we observe immediately that they have a certain relation to themselves it may sound ridiculous to be asserting what is obvious to every one but it is only by coming to a clear understanding together about what we know that we can advance to what we do not know i think interrupted edward we can make the thing more clear to her and to ourselves with examples conceive water or oil or quicksilver among these you will see a certain oneness a certain connection of their parts and this oneness is never lost except through force or some other determining cause let the cause cease to operate and at once the parts unite again unquestionably said charlotte that is plain raindrops readily unite and form streams and when we were children it was our delight to play with quicksilver and wonder at the little globules splitting and parting and running into one another and here said the captain let me just cursorily mention one remarkable thing i mean that the full complete correlation of parts which the fluid state makes possible shows itself distinctly and universally in the globular form the falling water drop is round you yourself spoke of the globules of quicksilver and a drop of melted lead let fall if it is time to harden before it reaches the ground is found at the bottom in the shape of a ball let me try and see said charlotte whether i can understand where you are bringing me as everything has a reference to itself so it must have some relation to others and that interrupted edward will be different according to the natural differences of the things themselves sometimes they will meet like friends and old acquaintances they will come rapidly together and unite without either having to alter itself at all as wine mixes with water others again will remain as strangers side by side and no amount of mechanical mixing or forcing will succeed in combining them oil and water may be shaken up together and the next moment they are separate again each by itself one can almost fancy said charlotte that in these simple forms one sees people that one is acquainted with one has met with just such things in the societies among which one has lived and the strangest likenesses of all with these soulless creatures are in the masses in which men stand divided one against the other in their classes and professions the nobility and the third estate for instance or soldiers and civilians then again replied edward as these are united together under common laws and customs so there are intermediate members in our chemical world which will combine elements that are mutually repulsive oil for instance said the captain we may combine with water with the help of alkalis do not go on too fast with your lessons said charlotte let me see that i keep step with you are we not here arrived among the affinities exactly replied the captain we are on the point of apprehending them in all their power and distinctness such natures as when they come in contact at once lay hold of each other and mutually affect one another we speak of as having an affinity for the other 
with the alkalis and acids for instance the affinities are strikingly marked they are of opposite natures very likely their being of opposite natures is the secret of their effect on one another they seek one another eagerly out lay hold of each other modify each other's character and form in connection an entirely new substance there is lime you remember which shows the strongest inclination for all sorts of acids a distinct desire of combining with them as soon as our chemical chest arrives we can show you a number of entertaining experiments which will give you a clearer idea than words and names and technical expressions it appears to me said charlotte that if you choose to call these strange creatures of yours related the relationship is not so much a relationship of blood as of soul or of spirit it is the way in which we see all really deep friendships arise among men opposite peculiarities of disposition being what best makes internal union possible but i will wait to see what you can really show me of these mysterious proceedings and for the present she added turning to edward i will promise not to disturb you any more in your reading you have told me enough of what it is about to enable me to attend to it no no replied edward now that you have once stirred the thing you shall not get off so easily it is just the most complicated cases which are the most interesting in these you come first to see the degrees of the affinities to watch them as their power of attraction is weaker or stronger nearer or more remote affinities only begin really to interest when they bring about separations what cried charlotte is that miserable word which unhappily we hear so often nowadays in the world is that to be found in nature's lessons too most certainly answered edward the title with which chemists were supposed to be most honourably distinguished was artists of separation it is not so any more replied charlotte and it is well that it is not it is a higher art and it is a higher merit to unite an artist of union is what we should welcome in every province of the universe however as we are on the subject again give me an instance or two of what you mean we had better keep said the captain to the same instances of which we have already been speaking thus what we call limestone is a more or less pure calcareous earth in combination with a delicate acid which is familiar to us in the form of a gas now if we place a piece of this stone in diluted sulphuric acid this will take possession of the lime and appear with it in the form of gypsum the gaseous acid at the same going off in vapour here is a case of separation a combination arises and we believe ourselves now justified in applying to it the words elective affinity it really looks as if one relation had been deliberately chosen in preference to another forgive me said charlotte as i forgive the natural philosopher i cannot see any choice in this i see a natural necessity rather and scarcely that after all it is perhaps merely a case of opportunity opportunity makes relations as it makes thieves and as long as the talk is only of natural substances the choice to me appears to be altogether in the hands of the chemist who brings the creatures together once however let them be brought together and then god have mercy on them in the present case i cannot help being sorry for the poor acid gas which is driven out up and down infinity again the acid's business answered the captain is now to get connected with water and so serve as a mineral fountain for the refreshing of sound or disordered mankind that is very well for the gypsum to say said charlotte the gypsum is all right is a body is provided for the other poor desolate creature may have trouble enough to go through before it can find a second home for itself i am much mistaken said edward smiling if there be not some little hidden meaning behind this confess your wickedness you mean me by your lime the lime is laid hold of by the captain in the form of sulphuric acid torn away from your agreeable society and metamorphosed into refractory gypsum if your conscience prompts you to make such a reflection replied charlotte i certainly need not distress myself these comparisons are pleasant and entertaining and who is there that does not like playing with analogies but man is raised very many steps above these elements and if he has been somewhat liberal with such fine words as election and elective affinities he will do well to turn back again into himself and take the opportunity of considering carefully the value and meaning of such expressions unhappily we know cases enough where connection apparently indissoluble between two persons has by the accidental introduction of a third been utterly destroyed and one or the other of the once happily united pair been driven out into the wilderness then you see how much more gallant the chemists are said edward they at once add a fourth that neither may go away empty quite so replied the captain and those are the cases which are really most important and remarkable cases where this attraction this affinity this separating and combining can be exhibited the two pairs severally crossing each other where four creatures connected previously as two and two are brought into contact and at once forsake their first combination to form into a second 
in this forsaking and embracing this seeking and flying we believe that we are indeed observing the effects of some higher determination we attribute a sort of will and choice to such creatures and feel really justified in using technical words and speaking of elective affinities give me an instance of this said charlotte one should not spoil such things with words replied the captain as i said before as soon as i can show you the experiment i can make it all intelligible and pleasant for you for the present i can give you nothing but horrible scientific expressions which at the same time will give you no idea about the matter you ought yourself to see these creatures which seem so dead and which are yet so full of inward energy and force at work before your eyes you should observe them with a real personal interest now they seek each other out attract each other seize crush devour destroy each other and then suddenly reappear again out of their combinations and come forward in fresh renovated unexpected form thus you will comprehend how we attribute to them a sort of immortality how we speak of them as having sense and understanding because we feel our own senses to be insufficient to observe them adequately and our reason too weak to follow them i quite agree said edward that the strange scientific nomenclature to persons who have not been reconciled to it by a direct acquaintance with or understanding of its object must seem unpleasant even ridiculous but we can easily just for once contrive with symbols to illustrate what we are speaking of if you do not think it looks pedantic answered the captain i can put my meaning together with letters suppose an a connected so closely with a b that all sorts of means even violence have been made use of to separate them without effect then suppose a c in exactly the same position with respect to d bring the two pairs into contact a will fling himself on d c on b without its being possible to say which had first left its first connection or made the first move toward the second now then interposed edward till we see all this with our eyes we will look upon the formula as an analogy out of which we can devise a lesson for immediate use you stand for a charlotte and i am your b really and truly i cling to you i depend on you and follow you just as b does with a c is obviously the captain who at present is in some degree withdrawing me from you so now it is only just that if you are not to be left to solitude a d should be found for you and that is unquestionably the amiable little lady ottilie you will not hesitate any longer to send and fetch her good replied charlotte although the example does not in my opinion exactly fit our case however we have been fortunate at any rate in to-day for once having met all together and these natural or elective affinities have served to unite us more intimately i will tell you that since this afternoon i have made up my mind to send for ottilie my faithful housekeeper on whom i have hitherto depended for everything is going to leave me shortly to be married it was done at my own suggestion i believe to please me what it is which has decided me about ottilie you shall read to me i will not look over the pages again indeed the contents of them are already known to me only read read with these words she produced a letter and handed it to edward End of chapter four chapter five of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee in Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter 5. Letter of the Lady Superior. Your ladyship will forgive the brevity of my present letter. The public examinations are but just concluded, and I have to communicate to all the parents and guardians the progress which our pupils have made during the past year. To you I may well be brief, having to say much in few words. Your ladyship's daughter has proved herself first in every sense of the word. The testimonials which I enclose, and her own letter, in which she will detail to you the prizes which she has won, and the happiness which she feels in her success, will surely please, and I hope delight you. For myself, it is the less necessary that I should say much, because I see that there will soon be no more occasion to keep with us a young lady so far advanced. I send my respects to your ladyship, and in a short time I shall take the liberty of offering you my opinion as to what in future may be of most advantage to her. My good assistant will tell you about Ottilie. Letter of the Assistant Our reverend superior leaves it to me to write to you of Ottilie, partly because, with her ways of thinking about it, it would be painful to her to say what has to be said, partly because she herself requires some excusing, which she would rather have done for her by me. Knowing, as I did too well, how little able the good Ottilie was to show out what lies in her, and what she is capable of, I was all along afraid of this public examination. I was the more uneasy, as it was to be of a kind which does not admit of any especial preparation, and even if it had been conducted as usual, Ottilie never can be prepared to make a display. 
the result has only too entirely justified my anxiety she has gained no prize she is not even among those whose names have been mentioned with approbation i need not go into details in writing the letters of the other girls were not so well formed but their strokes were far more free in arithmetic they were all quicker than she and in the more difficult problems which she does the best there was no examination in french she was outshone and outtalked by many and in history she was not ready with her names and dates in geography there was a want of attention to the political divisions and for what she could do in music there was neither time nor quiet enough for her few modest melodies to gain attention in drawing she certainly would have gained the prize her outlines were clear and the execution most careful and full of spirit unhappily she had chosen too large a subject and it was incomplete after the pupils were dismissed the examiners consulted together and we teachers were partially admitted into the council i very soon observed that of ottilie either nothing would be said at all or if her name was mentioned it would be with indifference if not absolute disapproval i hoped to obtain some favour for her by a candid description of what she was and i ventured it with the greater earnestness partly because i was only speaking my real convictions and partly because i remembered in my own younger years finding myself in the same unfortunate case i was listened to with attention but as soon as i had ended the presiding examiner said to me very kindly but laconically we presume capabilities they are to be converted into accomplishments this is the aim of all education it is what is distinctly intended by all who have the care of children and silently and indistinctly by the children themselves this also is the object of examinations where teachers and pupils are alike standing their trial from what we learn of you we may entertain good hopes of the young lady and it is to your own credit also that you have paid so much attention to your pupil's capabilities if in the coming year you can develop these into accomplishments neither yourself nor your pupil shall fail to receive your due praise i had made up my mind to what must follow upon all this but there was something worse that i had not anticipated which had soon to be added to it our good superior who like a trusty shepherdess could not bear to have one of her flock lost or as was the case here to see it undistinguished after the examiners were gone could not contain her displeasure and said to ottilie who was standing quite quietly by the window while the others were exulting over their prizes tell me for heaven's sake how can a person look so stupid if she is not so ottilie replied quite calmly forgive me my dear mother i have my headache again to-day and it is very painful kind and sympathizing as she generally is the superior this time answered no one can believe that and turned angrily away now it is true no one can believe it for ottilie never alters the expression of her countenance i have never even seen her move her hand to her head when she has been asleep nor was this all your ladyship's daughter who is at all times sufficiently lively and impetuous after her triumph to-day was overflowing with the violence of her spirits she ran from room to room with her prizes and testimonials and shook them in ottilie's face you have come badly off this morning she cried ottilie replied in her calm quiet way this is not the last day of trial but you will always remain the last cried the other and ran away no one except myself saw that ottilie was disturbed she has a way when she experiences any sharp unpleasant emotion which she wishes to resist of showing it in the unequal colour of her face the left cheek becomes for a moment flushed while the right turns pale i perceived this symptom and i could not prevent myself from saying something i took our superior aside and spoke seriously to her about it the excellent lady acknowledged that she had been wrong we considered the whole affair we talked it over at great length together and not to weary your ladyship i will tell you at once the desire with which we concluded namely that you will for a while have ottilie with yourself our reasons you will yourself readily perceive if you consent i will say more to you on the manner in which i think she should be treated the young lady your daughter we may expect will soon leave us and we shall then with pleasure welcome ottilie back to us one thing more which another time i might forget to mention i have never seen ottilie eager for anything or at least ask pressingly for anything but there have been occasions however rare when on the other hand she has wished to decline things which have been pressed upon her and she does it with a gesture which to those who have caught its meaning is irresistible she raises her hands presses the palms together and draws them against her breast leaning her body a little forward at the same time and turns such a look upon the person who is urging her 
that he will be glad enough to cease to ask or wish for anything of her if your ladyship ever sees this attitude as with your treatment of her it is not likely that you will think of me and spare ottilie edward read these letters aloud not without smiles and shakes of the head naturally too there were observations made on the persons and on the position of the affair enough edward cried at last it is decided she comes you my love are provided for and now we can get forward with our work it is becoming highly necessary for me to move over to the right wing to the captain evenings and mornings are the time for us best to work together and then you on your side will have admirable room for yourself and ottilie charlotte made no objection and edward sketched out the method in which they should live among other things he cried it is really very polite in this niece to be subject to a slight pain on the left side of her head i have it frequently on the right if we happen to be afflicted together and sit opposite one another i leaning on my right elbow and she on her left and our heads on the opposite sides resting on our hands what a pretty pair of pictures we shall make the captain thought that might be dangerous no no cried out edward only do you my dear friend take care of the d for what will become of b if poor c is taken away from it that i should have thought would have been evident enough replied charlotte and it is indeed cried edward he would turn back to his a to his alpha and omega and he sprang up and taking charlotte in his arms pressed her to his breast end of chapter five chapter six of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe chapter six the carriage which brought ottilie drove up to the door charlotte went out to receive her the dear girl ran to meet her threw herself at her feet and embraced her knees why such humility said charlotte a little embarrassed and endeavouring to raise her from the ground it is not meant for humility ottilie answered without moving from the position in which she had placed herself i am only thinking of the time when i could not reach higher than to your knees and when i had just learned to know how you loved me she stood up and charlotte embraced her warmly she was introduced to the gentleman and was at once treated with especial courtesy as a visitor beauty is a welcome guest everywhere she appeared attentive to the conversation without taking a part in it the next morning edward said to charlotte what an agreeable entertaining girl she is entertaining answered charlotte with a smile why she has not opened her lips yet indeed said edward as he seemed to bethink himself that is very strange charlotte had to give the newcomer but a very few hints on the management of the household ottilie saw rapidly all the arrangements and what was more she felt them she comprehended easily what was to be provided for the whole party and what for each particular member of it everything was done with the utmost punctuality she knew how to direct without appearing to be giving orders and when any one had left anything undone she at once set it right herself as soon as she had found how much time she would have to spare she begged charlotte to divide her hours for her and to these she adhered exactly she worked at what was set before her in the way which the assistant had described to charlotte they let her alone it was but seldom that charlotte interfered sometimes she changed her pens for others which had been written with to teach her to make bolder strokes in her handwriting but these she found would be soon cut sharp and fine again the ladies had agreed with one another when they were to speak nothing but french and charlotte persisted in it the more as she found ottilie more ready to talk in a foreign language when she was told it was her duty to exercise herself in it in this way she often said more than she seemed to intend charlotte was particularly pleased with the description most complete but at the same time most charming and amiable which she gave her one day by accident of the school she soon felt her to be a delightful companion and before long she hoped to find in her an attached friend at the same time she looked over again the more early accounts which had been sent her of ottilie to refresh her recollection with the opinion which the superior and the assistant had formed about her and compare them with her in her own person for charlotte was of opinion that we cannot too quickly become acquainted with the character of those with whom we have to live that we may know what to expect of them where we may hope to do anything in the way of improvement with them and what we must make up our minds once for all to tolerate and let alone this examination led her to nothing new indeed but much which she already knew became of greater meaning and importance ottilie's moderation in eating and drinking for instance became a real distress to her the next thing on which the ladies were employed was ottilie's toilet charlotte wished her to appear in clothes of a richer and more distinguished sort 
and at once the clever active girl herself cut out the stuff which had been previously sent to her and with a very little assistance from others was able in a short time to dress herself out most tastefully the new fashionable dresses set off her figure an agreeable person it is true will show through all disguises but we always fancy it looks fresher and more graceful when its peculiarities appear under some new drapery and thus from the moment of her first appearance she became more and more a delight to the eyes of all who beheld her as the emerald refreshes the sight with its beautiful hues and exerts it is said a beneficent influence on that noble sense so does human beauty work with far larger potency on the outward and on the inward sense whoever looks upon it is charmed against the breath of evil and feels in harmony with himself and with the world in many ways therefore the party had gained by ottilie's arrival the captain and edward kept regularly to the hours even to the minutes for their general meeting together they never kept the others waiting for them either for dinner or tea or for their walks and they were in less haste especially in the evenings to leave the table this did not escape charlotte's observation she watched them both to see whether one more than the other was the occasion of it but she could not perceive any difference they had both become more companionable in their conversation they seemed to consider what was best adapted to interest ottilie what was most on a level with her capacities and her general knowledge if she left the room when they were reading or telling stories they would wait till she returned they had grown softer and altogether more united in return for this ottilie's anxiety to be of use increased every day the more she came to understand the house its inmates and their circumstances the more eagerly she entered into everything caught every look and every motion half a word a sound was enough for her with her calm attentiveness and her easy unexcited activity she was always the same sitting rising up going coming fetching carrying returning to her place again it was all in the most perfect repose a constant change a constant agreeable movement while at the same time she went about so lightly that her step was almost inaudible this cheerful obligingness in ottilie gave charlotte the greatest pleasure there was one thing however which she did not exactly like of which she had to speak to her it is very polite in you she said one day to her when people let anything fall from their hand to be so quick in stooping and picking it up for them at the same time it is a sort of confession that they have a right to require such attention and in the world we are expected to be careful to whom we pay it toward women i will not prescribe any rule as to how you should conduct yourself you are young to those above you and older than you services of this sort are a duty toward your equals they are polite to those younger than yourself and your inferiors you may show yourself kind and good-natured by such things only it is not becoming in a young lady to do them for men i will try to forget the habit replied ottilie i think however you will in the meantime forgive me for my want of manners when i tell you how i came by it we were taught history at school i have not gained as much out of it as i ought for i never knew what use i was to make of it a few little things however made a deep impression upon me among which was the following when charles i of england was standing before his so-called judges the gold top came off the stick which he had in his hand and fell down accustomed as he had been on such occasions to have everything done for him he seemed to look round and expect that this time too some one would do him this little service no one stirred and he stooped down for it himself it struck me as so piteous that from that moment i have never been able to see any one let a thing fall without myself picking it up but of course as it is not always proper and as i cannot she continued smiling tell my story every time i do it in future i will try and contain myself in the meantime the fine arrangements which the two friends had been led to make for themselves went uninterruptedly forward every day they found something new to think about and undertake one day as they were walking together through the village they had to remark with dissatisfaction how far behindhand it was in order and cleanliness compared to villages where the inhabitants were compelled by the expense of building ground to be careful about such things you remember a wish we once expressed when we were travelling in switzerland together said the captain that we might have the laying out of some country park and how beautiful we would make it by introducing into some village situated like this not the swiss style of building but swiss order and neatness which so much improve it and how well it would answer here the hill on which the castle stands slopes down to that projecting angle the village you see is built in a semicircle regularly enough just opposite to it the brook runs between it is liable to floods and do observe the way the people set about protecting themselves from them one with stones another with stakes the next puts up a boarding and a fourth tries beams and planks no one of course doing any good to another with his arrangement but only hurting himself 
and the rest too and then there is the road going along just in the clumsiest way possible uphill and down through the water and over the stones if the people would only lay their hands to the business together it would cost them nothing but a little labour to run a semicircular wall along here take the road in behind it raising it to the level of the houses and so give themselves a fair open space in front making the whole place clean and getting rid once for all in one good general work of all their little trifling ineffectual makeshifts let us try it said the captain as he ran his eyes over the lay of the ground and saw quickly what was to be done i can undertake nothing in company with peasants and shopkeepers replied edward unless i may have unrestricted authority over them you are not so wrong in that returned the captain i have experienced too much trouble myself in life in matters of that kind how difficult it is to prevail on a man to venture boldly on making a sacrifice for an after advantage how hard to get him to desire an end and not hesitate at the means so many people confuse means with ends they keep hanging over the first without having the other before their eyes every evil is to be cured at the place where it comes to the surface and they will not trouble themselves to look for the cause which produces it or the remote effect which results from it this is why it is so difficult to get advice listened to especially among the many they can see clearly enough from day to day but their scope seldom reaches beyond the morrow and if it comes to a point where with some general arrangement one person will gain while another will lose there is no prevailing on them to strike a balance works of public advantage can only be carried through by an uncontrolled absolute authority while they were standing and talking a man came up and begged of them he looked more impudent than really in want and edward who was annoyed at being interrupted after two or three fruitless attempts to get rid of him by a gentler refusal spoke sharply to him the fellow began to grumble and mutter abusively he went off with short steps talking about the right of beggars it was all very well to refuse them an alms but that was no reason why they should be insulted a beggar and everybody else too was as much under god's protection as a lord it put edward out of all patience the captain to pacify him said let us make use of this as an occasion for extending our rural police arrangements to such cases we are bound to give away money but we do better in not giving it in person especially at home we should be moderate and uniform in everything in our charities as in all else too great liberality attracts beggars instead of helping them on their way at the same time there is no harm when one is on a journey or passing through a strange place in appearing to a poor man in the street in the form of a chance deity of fortune and making him some present which shall surprise him the position of the village and of the castle makes it easy for us to put our charities here on a proper footing i have thought about it before the public house is at one end of the village a respectable old couple live at the other at each of these places deposit a small sum of money and let every beggar not as he comes in but as he goes out receive something both houses lie on the roads which lead to the castle so that any one who goes there can be referred to one or the other come said edward we will settle that on the spot the exact sum can be made up another time they went to the innkeeper and to the old couple and the thing was done i know very well edward said as they were walking up the hill to the castle together that everything in this world depends on distinctness of idea and firmness of purpose your judgment of what my wife has been doing in the park was entirely right and you have already given me a hint how it might be improved i will not deny that i told her of it so i have been led to suspect replied the captain and i could not approve of your having done so you have perplexed her she has left off doing anything and on this one subject she is vexed with us she avoids speaking of it she has never since invited us to go with her to the summer-house although at odd hours she goes up there with ottilie we must not allow ourselves to be deterred by that answered edward if i am once convinced about anything good which could and should be done i can never rest till i see it done we are clever enough at other times in introducing what we want into the general conversation suppose we have out some descriptions of english parks with copper plates for our evening's amusement then we can follow with your plan we will treat it first problematically and as if we are only in jest there will be no difficulty in passing into earnest the scheme was concerted and the books were opened in each group of designs they first saw a ground plan of the spot with the general character of the landscape drawn in its rude natural state then followed others showing the changes which had been produced by art to employ and set off the natural advantages of the locality from these to their own property and their own grounds the transition was easy everybody was pleased the chart which the captain had sketched was brought and spread out the only difficulty was that they could not entirely free themselves of the plan which charlotte had begun 
However, an easier way up the hill was found. A lodge was suggested to be built on the height at the edge of the cliff, which was to have an especial reference to the castle. It was to form a conspicuous object from the castle windows, and from it the spectator was to be able to overlook both the castle and the garden. The captain had thought it all carefully over, and taken his measurements, and now he brought up again the village road and the wall by the brook, and the ground which was to be raised behind it. Here, you see, said he, while I make this charming walk up the height, I gain exactly the quantity of stone which I require for that wall. Let one piece of work help the other, and both will be carried out most satisfactorily, and most rapidly. But now, said Charlotte, comes my side of the business. A certain definite outlay of money will have to be made. We ought to know how much will be wanted for such a purpose, and then we can apportion it out, so much work and so much money, if not by weeks, at least by months. The cash-box is under my charge. I pay the bills, and I keep the accounts. You do not appear to have overmuch confidence in us, said Edward. I have not much in arbitrary matter, Charlotte answered, where it is a case of inclination. We women know better how to control ourselves than you. It was settled. The dispositions were made, and the work was begun at once. The captain being always on the spot, Charlotte was almost daily a witness to the strength and clearness of his understanding. He too learned to know her better, and it became easy for them both to work together, and thus bring something to completeness. It is with work as with dancing. Persons who keep the same step must grow indispensable to one another. Out of this a mutual kindly feeling will necessarily arise, and that Charlotte had a real kind feeling toward the captain, after she came to know him better was sufficiently proved by her allowing him to destroy her pretty seat, which in her first plan she had taken such pains in ornamenting, because it was in the way of his own, without experiencing the slightest feeling about the matter. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Elective Affinities This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter 7. Now that Charlotte was occupied with the captain, it was a natural consequence that Edward should attach himself more to Ottilie. Independently of this, indeed, for some time past he had begun to feel a silent kind of attraction towards her. Obliging and attentive she was to every one, but his self-love whispered that towards him she was particularly so she had observed his little fancies about his food she knew exactly what things he liked and the way in which he liked them to be prepared the quantity of sugar which he liked in his tea and so on moreover she was particularly careful to prevent draughts about which he was excessively sensitive and indeed about which with his wife who could never have air enough he was often at variance so too she had come to know about fruit gardens and flower gardens whatever he liked it was her constant effort to procure for him and to keep away whatever annoyed him so that very soon she grew indispensable to him. She became like his guardian angel, and he felt it keenly whenever she was absent. Besides all this, too, she appeared to grow more open and conversable as soon as they were alone together. Edward, as he had advanced in life, had retained something childish about himself, which corresponded singularly well with the youthfulness of Ottilie. They liked talking of early times, when they had first seen each other, and these reminiscences led them up to the first epoch of Edward's affection for Charlotte. Ottilie declared that she remembered them both as the handsomest pair about the court, and when Edward would question the possibility of this, when she must have been so exceedingly young, she insisted that she recollected one particular instant as clearly as possible. He had come into the room where her aunt was, and she had hid her face in Charlotte's lap, not from fear, but from a childish surprise. She might have added, because he had made so strong an impression upon her, because she had liked him so much. While they were occupied in this way, much of the business which the two friends had undertaken together had come to a standstill so that they found it necessary to inspect how things were going on to work up a few designs and get letters written for this purpose they betook themselves to their office where they found their old copyist at his desk they set themselves to their work and soon gave the old man enough to do without observing that they were laying many things on his shoulders which at other times they had always done for themselves at the same time the first design the captain tried would not answer and edward was as unsuccessful with his first letter they fretted for a while planning and erasing till at last edward who was getting on the worst asked what o'clock it was and then it appeared that the captain had forgotten for the first time for many years to wind up his chronometer and they seemed if not to feel at least to have a dim perception that time was beginning to be indifferent to them in the meanwhile as the gentlemen were thus slackening in their energy 
the activity of the ladies increased all the more the everyday life of a family which is composed of given persons and is shaped out of necessary circumstances may easily receive into itself an extraordinary affection an incipient passion may receive it into itself as into a vessel and a long time may elapse before the new ingredient produces a visible effervescence and runs foaming over the edge with our friends the feelings which were mutually arising had the most agreeable effects their dispositions opened out and a general good will arose out of the several individual affections every member of the party was happy and they each shared their happiness with the rest such a temper elevates the spirit while it enlarges the heart and everything which under the influence of it people do and undertake has a tendency towards the illimitable the friends could not remain any more shut up at home their walks extended themselves further and further edward would hurry on before with ottilie to choose the path or pioneer the way and the captain and charlotte would follow quietly on the track of their more hasty precursors talking on some grave subject or delighting themselves with some spot they had newly discovered or some unexpected natural beauty one day their walk led them down from the gate at the right wing of the castle in the direction of the hotel and thence over the bridge towards the ponds along the sides of which they proceeded as far as it was generally thought possible to follow the water thickly wooded hills sloping directly up from the edge and beyond these a wall of steep rocks making further progress difficult if not impossible but edward whose hunting experience had made him thoroughly familiar with the spot pushed forward along an overgrown path with ottilie knowing well that the old mill could not be far off which was somewhere in the middle of the rocks there the path was so little frequented that they soon lost it and for a short time they were wandering among mossy stones and thickets it was not long however the noise of the water wheel speedily telling them that the place which they were looking for was close at hand stepping forward on a point of rock they saw the strange old dark wooden building in the hollow before them quite shadowed over with precipitous crags and huge trees they determined directly to climb down amidst the moss and the blocks of stone edward led the way and when he looked back and saw ottilie following stepping lightly without fear or nervousness from stone to stone so beautifully balancing herself he fancied he was looking at some celestial creature floating above him while if as she often did she caught the hand which in some difficult spot he would offer her or if she supported herself on his shoulder then he was left in no doubt that it was a very exquisite human creature who touched him he almost wished that she might slip or stumble that he might catch her in his arms and press her to his heart this however he would under no circumstances have done for more than one reason he was afraid to wound her and he was afraid to do her some bodily injury what the meaning of this could be we shall immediately learn when they had got down and were seated opposite each other at a table under the trees and when the miller's wife had gone for milk and the miller who had come out to them was sent to meet charlotte and the captain edward with a little embarrassment began to speak i have a request to make dear ottilie you will forgive me for asking it if you will not grant it you make no secret i am sure you need not make any that you wear a miniature under your dress against your breast it is the picture of your noble father you could hardly have known him but in every sense he deserves a place by your heart only forgive me the picture is exceedingly large and the metal frame and the glass if you take up a child in your arms if you are carrying anything if the carriage swings violently if we are pushing through bushes or just now as we were coming down these rocks cause me a thousand anxieties for you any unforeseen blow a fall a touch may be fatally injurious to you and i am terrified at the possibility of it for my sake do this put away the picture not out of your affections not out of your room let it have the brightest the holiest place which you can give it only do not wear upon your breast a thing the presence of which seems to me perhaps from an extravagant anxiety so dangerous ottilie said nothing and while he was speaking she kept her eyes fixed straight before her then without hesitation and without haste with a look turned more towards heaven than on edward she unclasped the chain drew out the picture and pressed it against her forehead and then reached it over to her friend with the words do you keep it for me till we come home i cannot give you a better proof how deeply i thank you for your affectionate care he did not venture to press the picture to his lips but he caught her hand and raised it to his eyes they were perhaps two of the most beautiful hands which had ever been clasped together he felt as if a stone had fallen from his heart as if a partition wall had been thrown down between him and ottilie under the miller's guidance charlotte and the captain came down by an easier path and now joined them there was the meeting and a happy talk and then they took some refreshments they would not return by the same way as they came and edward struck into a rocky path on the other side of the stream from which the ponds were again to be seen they made their way along it with some effort and then had to cross a variety of wood and copse 
getting glimpses on the land side of a number of villages and manor houses with their green lawns and fruit gardens while very near them and sweetly situated on a rising ground a farm lay in the middle of the wood from a gentle ascent they had a view before and behind which showed them the richness of the country to the greatest advantage and then entering a grove of trees they found themselves on again emerging from it on the rock opposite the castle they came upon it rather unexpectedly and were of course delighted they had made the circuit of a little world they were standing on the spot where the new building was to be erected and were looking again at the windows of their own home they went down to the summer-house and sat all four in it for the first time together nothing was more natural than that with one voice it should be proposed to have the way they had been that day and which as it was had taken them much time and trouble properly laid out and gravelled so that people might loiter along it at their leisure they each said what they thought and they reckoned up that the circuit over which they had taken many hours might be travelled easily with a good road all the way round to the castle in a single one already a plan was being suggested for making the distance shorter and adding a fresh beauty to the landscape by throwing a bridge across the stream below the mill where it ran into the lake when charlotte brought their inventive imagination somewhat to a standstill by putting them in mind of the expense which such an undertaking would involve there are ways of meeting that too replied edward we have only to dispose of that farm in the forest which is so pleasantly situated and which brings in so little in the way of rent the sum which will be set free will more than cover what we shall require and thus having gained an invaluable walk we shall receive the interest of well expended capital in substantial enjoyment instead of as now in the summing up at the end of the year vexing and fretting ourselves over the pitiful little income which is returned for it even charlotte with all her prudence had little to urge against this there had been indeed a previous intention of selling the farm the captain was ready immediately with a plan for breaking up the ground into small portions among the peasantry of the forest edward however had a simpler and shorter way of managing it his present steward had already proposed to take it off his hands he was to pay for it by instalments and so gradually as the money came in they would get their work forward from point to point so reasonable and prudent a scheme was sure of universal approbation and already in prospect they began to see their new walk winding along its way and to imagine the many beautiful views and charming spots which they hoped to discover in its neighbourhood to bring it all before themselves with greater fulness of detail in the evening they produced the new chart with the help of this they went over again the way that they had come and found various places where the walk might take a rather different direction with advantage their other scheme was now once more talked through and connected with the fresh design the site for the new house in the park opposite the castle was a second time examined into and approved and fixed upon for the termination of the intended circuit ottilie had said nothing all this time at length edward pushed the chart which had hitherto been lying before charlotte across to her begging her to give her opinion she still hesitated for a moment edward in his gentlest way again pressed her to let them know what she thought nothing had as yet been settled it was all as yet in embryo i would have the house built here she said as she pointed with her finger to the highest point of the slope on the hill it is true you cannot see the castle from thence for it is hidden by the wood but for that very reason you find yourself in another quite new world you lose village and houses and all at the same time the view of the ponds with the mill and the hills and mountains in the distance is singularly beautiful i have often observed it when i have been there she is right edward cried how could we have overlooked it this is what you mean ottilie is it not he took a lead pencil and drew a great black rectangular figure on the summit of the hill it went through the captain's soul to see his carefully and clearly drawn chart disfigured in such a way he collected himself however after a slight expression of his disapproval and went into the idea ottilie is right he said we are ready enough to walk any distance to drink tea or eat fish because they would not have tasted as well at home we require change of scene and change of objects your ancestors showed their judgment in the spot which they chose for the castle for it is sheltered from the wind with the conveniences of life close at hand a place on the contrary which is more for pleasure parties than for a regular residence may be very well yonder there and in the fair time of year the most agreeable hours may be spent there the more they talked it over the more conclusive was their judgment in favour of ottilie and edward could not conceal his triumph that the thought had been hers he was as proud as if he had hit upon it himself End of chapter seven chapter eight of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe chapter eight early the following morning the captain examined the spot 
he first threw off a sketch of what should be done and afterwards when the thing had been more completely decided on he made a complete design with accurate calculations and measurements it cost him a good deal of labour and the business connected with the sale of the farm had to be gone into so that both the gentlemen now found a fresh impulse to activity the captain made edward observe that it would be proper indeed that it would be a kind of duty to celebrate charlotte's birthday with laying the foundation stone not much was wanted to overcome edward's disinclination for such festivities for he quickly recollected that a little later ottilie's birthday would follow and that he could have a magnificent celebration for that charlotte to whom all this work and what it would involve was a subject for much serious and almost anxious thought busied herself in carefully going through the time and outlay which it was calculated would be expended on it during the day they rarely saw each other so that the evening meeting was looked forward to with all the more anxiety ottilie meantime was complete mistress of the household and how could it be otherwise with her quick methodical ways of working indeed her whole mode of thought was suited better to home life than to the world and to a more free existence edward soon observed that she only walked about with them out of a desire to please that when she stayed out late with them in the evening it was because she thought it a sort of social duty and that she would often find a pretext in some household matter for going in again consequently he soon managed so to arrange the walks which they took together that they should be at home before sunset and he began again what he had long left off to read aloud poetry particularly such as had for its subject the expression of a pure but passionate love they ordinarily sat in the evening in the same places round a small table charlotte on the sofa ottilie on a chair opposite to her and the gentleman on each side ottilie's place was on edward's right the side where he put the candle when he was reading at such times she would draw her chair a little nearer to look over him for ottilie also trusted her own eyes better than another person's lips and edward would then always make a move towards her that it might be as easy as possible for her indeed he would frequently make longer stops than necessary that he might not turn over before she had got to the bottom of the page charlotte and the captain observed this and exchanged many a quiet smile at it but they were both taken by surprise at another symptom in which ottilie's latent feeling accidentally displayed itself one evening which had been partly spoilt for them by a tedious visit edward proposed that they should not separate so early he felt inclined for music he would take his flute which he had not done for many days past charlotte looked for the sonatas which they generally played together and they were not to be found ottilie with some hesitation said that they were in her room she had taken them there to copy them and you can you will accompany me on the piano cried edward his eyes sparkling with pleasure i think perhaps i can ottilie answered she brought the music and sat down to the instrument the others listened and were sufficiently surprised to hear how perfectly ottilie had taught herself the piece but far more surprised were they at the way in which she contrived to adapt herself to edward's style of playing adapt herself is not the right expression charlotte's skill and power enabled her in order to please her husband to keep up with him when he went too fast and hold in for him if he hesitated but ottilie who had several times heard them play the sonata together seemed to have learnt it according to the idea in which they accompanied each other she had so completely made his defects her own that a kind of living whole resulted from it which did not move indeed according to exact rule but the effect of which was in the highest degree pleasant and delightful the composer himself would have been pleased to hear his work disfigured in a manner so charming charlotte and the captain watched this strange unexpected occurrence in silence with the kind of feeling with which we often observe the actions of children unable exactly to approve of them from the serious consequences which may follow and yet without being able to find fault perhaps with a kind of envy for indeed the regard of these two for one another was growing also as well as that of the others and it was perhaps only the more perilous because they were both stronger more certain of themselves and better able to restrain themselves the captain had already begun to feel that a habit which he could not resist was threatening to bind him to charlotte he forced himself to stay away at the hour when she commonly used to be at the works by getting up very early in the morning he contrived to finish there whatever he had to do and went back to the castle to his work in his own room the first day or two charlotte thought it was an accident she looked for him in every place where she thought he could possibly be then she thought she understood him and admired him all the more 
avoiding as the captain now did being alone with charlotte the more industriously did he labour to hurry forward the preparations for keeping her rapidly approaching birthday with all splendour while he was bringing up the new road from below behind the village he made the men under pretence that he wanted stones begin working at the top as well and work down to meet the others and he had calculated his arrangements so that the two should exactly meet on the eve of the day the excavations for the new house were already done the rock was blown away with gunpowder and a fair foundation stone had been hewn with a hollow chamber and a flat slab adjusted to cover it this outward activity these little mysterious purposes of friendship prompted by feelings which more or less they were obliged to repress rather prevented the little party when together from being as lively as usual edward who felt that there was a sort of void one evening called upon the captain to fetch his violin charlotte should play the piano and he should accompany her the captain was unable to refuse the general request and they executed together one of the most difficult pieces of music with an ease and freedom and feeling which could not but afford themselves and the two who were listening to them the greatest delight they promised themselves a frequent repetition of it as well as further practice together they do it better than we ottilie said edward we will admire them but we can enjoy ourselves together too End of chapter 8